Right now is kind of the best and worst time to buy a Mac. Best because, well, you sort of can't go wrong. They're all excellent machines, but the hard part is to choose because there's a lot of options out there, a lot of ways to configure them. So I'm gonna walk you through it. I've tested all of the current Macs that are out there in a lot of different configurations. So I can give you some real world feedback on what it's been like to work on those machines, specifically these ones. We'll talk about which form factor is right for you, the display, how much storage you need and how much RAM you might wanna configure. And I'm gonna build out five different price models, whether your needs are Word documents and Netflix, all the way up to high-end video and photo production. I'll let you know which Mac is right for you. And whichever computer you choose, the sponsor of this video, Clean My Mac X, is a great way to keep it running smooth. More about that later. Now I know I'm biting off a pretty big project here. There's hundreds of different configurations you could build. So I'm gonna have to systematize this whole video. Let's start off by what I'm gonna be talking about in terms of budget. Now, I'm just gonna divide people into two different categories. One, where you're budget sensitive and you are always gonna be concerned about every addition to the computer because you gotta stretch every dollar that you have available. And then there's what I'm gonna call budget flexible. This doesn't mean that you are rich or you don't care how much you spend on your computer, but it's more important to get exactly the right machine. So I think about this in terms of some people do work that they don't make any more money by having a faster computer because it's more about how fast they can type an email. Then there's another group that the performance of their machine actually can make them more money. That's who would be budget flexible. So think about it in those two terms as I go through all this. Let's take a quick tour of all the shapes and sizes of Macs that are available right now in the M2 era. So starting with the MacBook Air, it's available in both 13 and 15 inch sizes. There's relatively few upgrades you can make to them, but they're crazy portable and very performant. They will be able to take on most tasks. And a quick note, I have to insert somewhere, so I might as well do it now. All of these Macs are fast enough for most people now. Like you can do 4K video editing on these smaller M2 base machines. It is fast enough for most things. Basically, it's just how fast do you want to do it or do you need to take on more complicated tasks? I spend a bunch of time working on the 13 inch MacBook Air and I could edit 4K YouTube videos. I could work through all of my 50 megapixel photography. It's enough for most things, it just runs a little bit slower. So keep that in mind as we talk about this. In the olden days, if you bought a MacBook Air, it meant you couldn't do a lot of things. And it's just not like that anymore. The base models can do all the stuff. And while we're looking at the affordable end of things, the Mac Mini is the cheapest Mac you can get out there. It starts at 599. They actually lowered the price. This is a great entry point for anyone. You can just go and pick up whatever monitor that's out there, pair it with this thing, and you're up and running for a really good deal. Then we've got the MacBook Pro. There's still a 13 inch model kicking around, but doesn't have the upgrades. I don't recommend that. I'm not gonna talk about it at all. We're looking at the 14 inch and the 16 inch M2 MacBook Pros. These are the machines that I use. I've been using MacBook Pros for a long time, but the great news is that now you're not giving up any power compared to the desktop. They are just as fast. So you really just need to decide like, do you need to be portable or is it more useful to have a bunch of drives all plugged in at your desk? You can think about that use case for yourself, but you're not compromising actual performance, which is, Great. An awkward in between right now is the iMac 24 inch, which is an M1 processor still, it wasn't upgraded. I probably won't talk about the iMacs very much in this video because I recommend others ahead of them. I still really like this machine, even though it hasn't changed much since I reviewed it two years ago. It's definitely entry level, you can't upgrade it a lot, but you can edit videos on it and it is a great all in one. So. If it feels right for you and you like the fun colors, definitely don't be afraid to take a look at the iMac, but it's not kind of the best option out there. It's hard to be excited about it right now. So we're gonna spend less time on it. Whichever Mac you buy, it's gonna be fast and you wanna keep it that way in top condition and peak performance. So for example, when I need to do a screen recording for YouTube or I'm doing a virtual presentation, I need everything to be running smoothly. And I'm sure you can think of your own important moments when you're using your Mac. For moments like that, I use Clean My Mac, sponsor of this video. The best place to start is with SmartScan. It's an intelligent automated maintenance tool that you can run on a regular basis to clean up your digital clutter, protect you from malware and speed up performance. If you run it regularly, it'll just take a few seconds, or if you haven't run it on your machine before, it's kind of amazing how much it can find. There are tons of ways to clean my Mac X, keep things running smoothly, so make it part of your routine. Or if you wanna dig in further, they have tools like uninstaller, updater, and large old files to keep your Mac on track. And to keep up that performance every day, you can look to the menu app. Storage, memory, battery, CPU details, it's a way to keep an eye on everything going on on your Mac. So got an important event coming up with your computer? Don't be shy, use the seven day free trial, no commitments, click the link below 
and get 20% discount. And thanks again to Clean My Mac X for sponsoring this video. Now, if you want to get serious about your desktop, we have the Mac Studio. This is sort of the real Mac Pro of the modern era. It has all the performance, all of the ports. It just does everything great. I love the Mac Studio. And that leaves the Mac Pro, which is in a really weird place right now. It used to be that if you do high-end work, this is the machine you need. I loved it back in the Intel days. But now with Apple Silicon, it doesn't make that much sense anymore. You're not gonna get more performance than in the Mac Studio. So this is for a very small niche of people that need a lot of in and out ports like high-end audio, or I don't even know anybody personally that needs the new Mac Pro. The Mac Studio is probably what you need. So we won't talk about any more Mac Pro in this video. Ever since we moved from Intel to Apple processors, every Mac is a lot faster, just less issues all around. This is like I was saying, I mean, everything runs pretty smoothly, so you can't go too wrong, but there's still a lot of different choices of M2 to choose from. So let's figure out which one you need. Whichever configuration you choose, you're basically spending a $200 premium to go from the M2 Pro to the M2 Max. So I totally think it's worth it. It's mostly actually about GPU. So if you have CPU heavy tasks, it won't make that big of a difference, but you get a lot more GPU cores and you get double the media engines, two instead of one. So export speeds can be double in a lot of cases. I've tested, reviewed, and worked extensively on a lot of different machines with different configurations, but I don't have a build of comparable ones to all of them. So I can't do the benchmark spreadsheets that you can find elsewhere on the internet. I'll refer to them a little bit so you can see what it's like, but those tests are hard to do and they're already done. I'm gonna tell you what it's actually like in the real world to use these machines. First of all, the basic M2 found in the MacBook Air and the Mac Mini, it can handle all the applications you want. I've worked with it with Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, Final Cut Pro, Resolve, and on and on. It can handle all this stuff. It's gonna have slower export speeds. So think about if you do a lot of photography and need to export 100 photos at a time, it'll really slow down. You'll notice it then. But if you're just doing one or two at a time, no big deal. Same with video, a basic 4K video with a few layers and lots of cuts. You'll have no issues and even the exports will be pretty speedy. But if those projects get complicated, you've got a lot of LUTs and titles, it can slow down on playback and on export. So it just depends, how complex are you getting here? And if the speed of your computer affects your income, I definitely think you're in that flexible budget group. And then you should be looking at the M2 Max. Now there's also the M2 Pro in between, but I hear from a lot of photographers and filmmakers that by buying the M2 Pro, they expected more performance and didn't quite get it. They still had similar slowdowns that you might have on the M2. And the M2 Max is what I use most of the time. So if you're gonna put more money into the machine, that's the first jump I would recommend. Go from the M2 to the Max, and you can edit almost anything. And above that, is the M2 Ultra. It's two M2 Max chips fused together. I tested it in the Mac Studio and it's amazing. It's crazy fast. Sometimes you will find double performance on specific tasks, not everything. Sometimes you won't even notice it's faster because the M2 Max is already fast enough. So this is a more narrow slice. Even most professional filmmakers, photographers, audio engineers can totally use the M2 Max and they will be happy. The Ultra is, splurging, it's the cherry on top. Now RAM, how much do you need? This is one of the most common and sort of complicated questions because it's hard to really monitor that performance. When your RAM fills up, it'll start using the SSD. So even if you don't have enough, you only have say eight gigabytes and you fill it, your machine will keep working. It's just that now it's writing files to that internal storage. So the base models come with eight gigabytes of RAM. That's like the MacBook Air or the Mac Mini. And this is, well, it's not enough RAM. In 2015, base models came with eight gigabytes of RAM and they still do today. That was eight years ago. It's time to move past it. But, you know, we're stuck choosing from what's available. So if you are budget sensitive, the eight gigs can do most tasks. Again, it will slow down more often. If you run multiple apps at the same time, that will definitely slow it down. But you can get by most tasks if you need to. Now, if you earn a living off your computer, at least get 32 gigabytes. That's kind of the like safe place. You can do your job with 32 gigs. It's enough. You probably won't be running into any issues. Of course, 64 is better, but it's harder to recommend because less people need that. 32 is the comfortable middle where a lot of us can sit and still get everything done. Now, the next button to click, how much storage do you need? The base models still come with 256, just like I said with RAM. That's not enough, but it, it sort of is. You can survive, but you should try to upgrade it to at least 512. Here's the thing, no matter which one you get, you're gonna need external drives. I, like 
what whatever it is you do, you should be backing things up externally. Everything shouldn't be local to your machine. So you're at least gonna need one external backup. And if you do media production like I do, you might you know, end up with a pile of drive something like this. These are not props. This isn't a bit I prepared. I just actually have these sitting around on my desk. So even if you max out your internal drive, I still think you're gonna need to buy externals. Keep that in mind. So 512 is enough for most people. If you do media production, I think you should at least have one terabyte because it's very helpful to store one or two active projects that you're working on on the local drive. The time saved is just, you know, plugging in and out drives and finding the right one and connecting the cable. It is much faster to have it all locally. And this is especially true of portable machines like the MacBook Pros, the MacBook Airs, then that's when you probably don't have a big external drive sitting nearby that's always plugged in. If you have a desktop, maybe you can rely on that more, but on the laptops, I like to have some extra space. Now let's talk about displays. They're built into all the MacBooks. The Airs have a 13 inch or 15 inch version that look great. They are very color accurate. They're about 500 nits of brightness, which is enough for most people. They're super sharp. They're just unobjectionable. These are great displays. I'd trust them for photo or video editing. But the MacBook Pros, they have insane displays. Like if you buy one, this might be the best screen that you end up having in your whole house. Its sustained brightness is twice as bright as those MacBook Airs, so 1000 nits instead of 500. And it can go up to a peak brightness of 1600. That's what you'll see in HDR content where the whites are super white. An amazing contrast ratio of one million to one. This is just some of Apple's best tech out there. Now, Apple also has the studio display. So if you're choosing a Mac mini or a Mac studio, this is maybe what you're gonna consider to put on your desk. These are definitely less exciting displays. They're very well built, but they're quite expensive. They only have 600 nits of brightness, which is enough, but not a lot. It's not impressive, but they are very color accurate, full P3 coverage. You can trust these displays for most things. They're just not exciting. They're sort of an older display tech, but very well built. Now there's also the very similar LG Ultrafine. This is actually probably the Mac display I've spent the most time on and it's worked very well for me. It looks great. It works well with the Mac. You don't have to worry about any special configuration, which is often an issue because there's many other 4K displays out there that are affordable, but they're not reliable. They don't look super sharp. The colors can be more unpredictable. If you wanna save money, that's up to you, but the only displays that I can personally recommend are the Studio Display and that LG Ultrafine or the Pro Display XDR, but you really need to have money to burn to choose that. One last consideration before I go through my recommended builds is the in and out ports available on your machine. This has improved a lot lately, especially with MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs getting MagSafe. We all love MagSafe for its quick release, but it also frees up one of your USB-C ports that you don't need to be charging through it. So whichever Mac you buy, you've now got one free port available. If you're really on the edge between a MacBook Air and Pro, I find the SD card reader and the HDMI port are kind of worth it just for the convenience of always having them available. It's kind of the only reason I don't choose to travel with the MacBook Air instead of the Pro to save the weight because I just love not having any dongles attached to my machine. And on the desktop side, keep in mind, if you go with the base model Mac mini, you're a little bit limited with your in and out. There are two Thunderbolt ports and two USB-A. If you get the M2 Pro version, you now double the amount of Thunderbolt ports. And the back of the Mac Studio is similar, also adding an ethernet port. Plus you get that card reader in the front and two more USB-C ports. So this is a lot of the reason the Mac Studio is my favorite thing to be sitting on my desk. Now, finally, the fun part, let's build some computers. Even though I'm based in Canada, I'm gonna be doing this in all US dollars just because more people know those numbers. So my first recommendation might be a bit of a surprise because I didn't even talk about it. And that's the M1 MacBook Air. Now I'm not recommending it too strongly, this is for the budget conscious, like you need to stretch your dollar. I'd just say you can go and pick up that base model, M1 MacBook Air 13 inch old design for just 9.99 and it'll work for you. Don't think about upgrading it. If you need the cheapest, it will do the basics. What more can I say? It's a good deal. But let's take it one step further. You still wanna be portable, but performant. So I'm gonna take a look at the 15 inch MacBook Air. I know a lot of people choose portability over screen size, but when you're working in applications like Final Cut or anything where you need to see the image, keep in mind you also need room for all of the interface around it. So I always choose the bigger display that's up to you, but I'm gonna look at the 15 inch here. I think it's worth getting the 512 SSD. I think it's worth bumping up the RAM to 16 gigs for all the reasons I said. 
and also the 512 SSD storage. So for about $1,700, you're getting pretty amazing performance. And one more reason to consider the 15 inch is that if you're getting a MacBook Air, you're less likely, I think, to be plugging into a display at home. So this might be the only screen that you use, might as well have it a little bigger. Also, one thing about the Air to consider is that a time it can slow down is running external displays. Even plugging the 13 inch into the Mac Studio display, I do find that can make things chug a little bit more. So it's not the best choice if you need to be running external displays. Now build number three is gonna be using a Mac mini. This is gonna give you a great desktop experience for a good price. I'm gonna choose the middle one here for $800, cause again, I don't know if the M2 Pro is really worth the upgrade, but I will spend an extra 200 on 16 gigs of RAM and I've already got 512 SSD, bringing the whole computer in at only $999. To keep the price down, but the performance up, I will recommend the LG Ultrafine Display, 27 inches, it looks great. I have heard some people have reliability issues in the long run with these. It's not built as nicely as the Mac Studio. Mine is still working great, so I don't mind saying this is a great 5K choice to go with your Mac Mini. And now I've got an amazing desktop for $2,000. $300. And now we'll build a Mac for me. This is the kind of thing that I would use all the time, a MacBook Pro. I work on the road a lot, so it's got to be 16 inches. Again, I'm going to skip the M2 Pro, go all the way up to the M2 Max. And this build, as it is, is just about right. We've got 32 gigs of RAM, one terabyte of SSD, and it's $3,500. This is getting a little expensive, but this is an amazing machine you can really work on just about anything using this MacBook Pro. And then for the ultimate, we're gonna look at the Mac Studio. I've said before, this is basically the modern Mac Pro. I think this pre-configured M2 Max is pretty good out of the gate. If I'm budget conscious, I don't even have to make any changes to it. The default M2 Max is generally enough. It's got the two media engines, comes with 32 gigs of memory and 512 SSD. Since this is a desktop, you can probably have an external nearby. So for $2,000, you've got an incredible machine. This is like more powerful than anything we've had in the past. And a machine like that deserves a great display. So I'd go with the Apple Studio display for $1,600, coming to a total of 3,600. For something that way outperforms that $10,000 Mac Pro that I reviewed a few years ago, we're really living in a great era of Macs. So hopefully one of these builds perfectly fits your needs. Let me know in the comments if you configured something different, how you would change what I recommended, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.